questions uh, on the uh, high throughput only electrophysiology instrument ironworks barracuda plus system. So just a little bit of the background. So we all know that the um, uh, the neurotoxins or the, uh, the the toxins from um, animals, plants, and microorganisms has been playing a very critical role in the understanding of uh, ion channel function and structure. Um, uh, during evolution, the, uh, the venomous and poisonous, uh, poisonous organisms turned out to be excellent pharmacologists um, like, uh, of the nature. Um, since their toxin evolved to be highly specific for targets in the CNS or PNS, central or, or peripheral nervous system. Examples shown here are the uh, toxins from jellyfish, uh, from um, spider or tarantula, from snake and cone, uh, cone snails. And um, depending on the uh, uh, types of toxins, they can be working on different ion channel types, including the potassium channel, sodium channel, and calcium channels. And so the mechanism of actions can also vary from modifying the gating machinery to uh, plugging the hole or the pole and, the, 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 and uh, uh, modulating the inactivation property of the biophysical property of the ion channels. As a matter of fact, the, uh, one of the uh, um, uh, conotoxins, one of the toxins has been developed into uh, uh, FDA-approved drug for managing chronic pain. This is uh, called zyconotide, which is uh, a synthetic peptide um, made from, um, made, uh, from the, uh, the, the cone snail toxin, and it has a potency for uh, um, uh, greater, than, uh, greater than morphine for 100 to 1,000 times. Just showing an example here that there are actually um, 700 species known to date that um, just from the cone snail, uh, uh, this species by itself, and each contains up to 200 different venom um, peptides. So implying there's a, a huge library of um, more than 100,000 compounds of possible pharmaceutical interests uh, that is potentially available in the venom. Uh, this is taken from a real article by Stevens uh, in 2011. So it's a... The, the toxin, neurotoxin as a, as a group has um, great potential in becoming uh, drug candidates for uh, a, a, a multitude of uh, human diseases. However, the, uh, the screening or the electrophysiological character, uh, characterization or especially the high throughput uh, electrophysiological characterization of the neurotoxins have, have been um, challenging uh, for many reasons. Um, a, few is, uh, a few are left here, including the physical chemical properties of the, uh, uh, the neurotoxins, uh, they typically are fairly large, uh, with molecular weights, uh, in thousands of, K, uh, thousands of deltons, um, in several kb versus, you know, small molecular compounds, um, in hundreds. And also different, um, neurotoxins may have different hydro, uh, so the interaction with the, uh, with the, with the ion channel and with the cell membrane can be highly diverse. Uh, this have a, has an impl uh, in implication on the um, toxin and channel interaction in the sense that the ion channels um, typically present several binding sites for different types of toxins. And depending on the, um, depending on the uh, uh, different binding sites, the affinity of the toxins to the, uh, um, to the channel can be highly variable. And also, what makes it a little tricky to analyze the uh, electrophysiological um, properties of the, this interaction is the uh, binding of the toxin to the channel can be highly dependent on the uh, state of the channel or the voltage uh, of the channel, of the uh, you know the membrane potential of the channel. Um, so this uh, voltage or state dependent binding affinities require highly sophisticated um, um, control of the uh, uh, membrane potential. To analyze the uh, the, tox the functional uh, impact of the toxin to channel interaction, and also in some cases the binding of the toxins to the channel can be fairly slow. Uh, you know, compared to small molecules, this can take um, tens of minutes to reach the peak um, uh, modulation effect. So, um, given the challenge we have right now to characterize the neurotoxins. Uh, what we strive to present here is a case study where we use Ironworks Barracuda system, which is a 
high throughput uh, automated patch clamp system to analyze this um, neurotoxin pharmacology. Right? Just a sort of a very brief um, introduction or reintroduction of the system. The Barracuda has 384 um, recording size, parallel recording size, and it has 384 discrete uh, patch clamp amplifiers and uh, uh, fluid, fluidic uh, channel pipettes. It can be run in both uh, single hole, uh, which records a single cell, one single cell at a time, or a PPC, which records uh, uh, ensemble signal of uh, six people cell um, per recording site. And also, uh, what makes the, uh, the, the Barracuda uh, very attractive is this um, highly sophisticated uh, fluidic design, which um, allows the, uh, the uh, precision and accuracy of compound addition to the uh, um, to the cells to the to the ion channels. So, without further ado, I'll um, show some of the examples where the barracuda can be utilized to um, tackle the uh, the the um, the pharmacology of neurotoxin. So, one of the features of barracuda is actually allows very uh, sophisticated programming of the voltage protocols, um, and it. And uh, in, in a mode we call the assay development mode, you can actually, the customer can actually run several different voltage protocols using the same batch of cells and the same um, patch plate in a way um, very similar to uh, the manual patch plant rig and uh, optimize their voltage protocols to the, to the, uh, um, to the, uh, uh, to the best of their expectation. Uh, shown here is an example where we, um, Use the same batch of cells and apply different uh, voltage protocols to characterize the voltage dependent activation, voltage dependence of inactivation, and also the recovery from recovery from the inactivation uh, for the sodium 1.5 channels, which is the um, uh, target of choice for uh, this study. And it's showing the uh, the characterization of the biophysical uh, parameters um, for both activation and inactivation. And uh, once you have the knowledge of the channel, uh, you can uh, program a protocol that best suits, uh, best suits your need. In this case, we have decided to use a uh, three-second uh, 10 hertz chain shown here on the bottom, so a total of 30, um, 30 depolarizing pulses in the chain. And the uh, current recording from such a voltage protocol is shown here, where um, the, the sodium current uh, uh, shown uh, in the uh, um, this, this, uh, there, um, if you zoom, zoom in, you can see the uh, very nice result uh, kinetic of the sodium channel activation and inactivation from both the pulse one and pulse thirty of the uh, of the chain, and the amplitude of the current are fairly um, stable within the chain. So. Um, in addition to the uh, sophistication of the voltage protocol for any pharmacological assay, especially for compounds with slow on, on rate or off rate, it's highly desirable to have a stable assay window. And what we're shown here is um, the proof principle study where we showed the, uh, the uh, current, in this case the sodium 1.5 current, uh, remains stable for up to 30 minutes um, uh, since the beginning of the recording. So uh, what's shown here is, um, you know, the, 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 the right bar here each indicates one pulse in the 30 minutes, uh, in, the, in the 30 pulse chain. So, and uh, the arrow here indicates the addition of the uh, just buffer solution, external buffer solution at the uh, different time point. And it shows like over uh, 30 minutes, the current remains fairly stable, not only within the, chain, uh, within the same um, chain, but also uh, at different time points. So having a stable uh, assay uh, current um, for up to 30 minutes uh, really allows us to um, tackle the, uh, the, the, uh, the compound with um, slow kinetics. And one of the examples that was shown previously in the, in the last webinar that Jim presented uh, is the utility of this long assay window to, uh, to measure both use dependent in addition by several uh, classic um, compounds like lidocaine and tetracaine, and also the off rate of the compound 
by applying fresh buffer to remove the, uh, the binding of the compound um, from the channel. So just to briefly recap, this is a control group where the current remains stable for up to 30 minutes, whereas in the group that's uh, in the group of cells that's treated with tetrakine, you can see immediately after the application of the tetrakine, there's a very um, striking use dependence where the first part of the current, the uh, first part of the chain, the current remains fairly large, and uh, towards the end of the chain, the third part, there's almost nothing left. And uh, upon the application of uh, the fresh buffer to remove the, um, uh, the, the, the binding of the tetrakine, you can see a gradual recovery of the P current um, to almost the baseline level. And this is more apparent for, more apparent for the, uh, uh, another um, compound, the lidokine, the uh, use dependence block and the removal of the use dependence block and the uh, um, recovery of the current to the baseline level. Uh, this is shown PTX, uh, not so much of use dependence, um, but can be, um, the, uh, the, the current can recover to the baseline level fairly, fairly, uh, nicely. Okay. So what we, um, what we are, um, trying to show here today is, uh, is another example, uh, we think, um, can be potentially applicable in the, uh, in the drug discovery field is to, Utilize a long assay window to um, analyze the voltage and the state-dependent modulation of the uh, neurotoxins, and also the slow um, on rate of the neurotoxins to the uh, sodium channel. So, a brief um, introduction to the experiment design. Uh, so, here we still use the human sodium 125 uh, channels uh, expressed in the CHL cell line, and uh, we chose uh, three different toxins. Um, uh, two from the, uh, the from a tarantula toxin. Uh, one is called a Jingda toxin two, which um, has a pronounced effect in slowing down the inactivation of the uh, uh, of the sodium channel, and it's uh, selective to uh, sodium 125 channel. Uh, the other one is called a protoxin two, which is a blocker of the uh, um, sodium 125 channel. Um, and uh, uh, as a negative control, we chose uh, toxin from uh, uh, neoconotoxin P3A, which is uh, selective for uh, sodium 1.4 channel, uh, and I have, um, uh, according to literature, very little effect on the 1.5 channels. So we made all this compound in, uh, in the final uh, solution uh, containing about 3%, uh, 0.3% of BSA. Um, and we're still using this 10 hertz, uh, 30 pulse chain to analyze the, uh, the, the, the uh, modulation of the channel by the neurotoxins. Um, so uh, just kind of give, give you a visual um, understanding of the, uh, of the uh, experiment design. We start with three baseline scans. With, uh, each scan is uh, three minutes apart from the, uh, the, the, the neighboring one. And then apply uh, the compound, in this case, uh, the, the, the a number of toxins, and uh, uh, a DMSO control as well. And then we performed 10 post-compound scans, again, with three minutes in between uh, each scan. So the whole assay is about um, 35 minutes long. Okay, so let's look at some of the data. So this is showing you the recording of the uh, uh, sodium channels, um, but only showing the, the, the first pause in the trend. So um, so you can have a, um, a good um, appreciation, appreciation of the channel kinetics. Um, the, uh, so first of all, there's almost 100% success rate except these two wells, which we know uh, coming from uh, hardware, uh, we have hardware arrows in those two wells. But uh, um, the rest of the plate uh, all give you very nice current. And, and also, because we're running this in the PPC mode, you're seeing that the uniformity of the current amplitude is, uh, is very good. Moving into the uh, uh, post-compound scan. This is post-compound scan two, which uh, uh, reference about four minutes into the uh, uh, compound addition. And you see in the group of cells that's uh, applied with Jing uh, toxin, you see a very um, striking difference between the control and the, the drug-treated um, 
uh, ion channel currents. One is um, the you know most of the thing uh, observation is the, uh, the the slowdown of the uh, inactivation, uh, and uh, there's some moderate enhancement of the peak current as well. Uh, in the group that's challenged by the protoxin too, you see essentially the majority of the current is uh, inhibited. And whereas compared to the uh, the next control, the the, the neoconotoxin or the vehicle control DMSO, there's um, virtually no change of current amplitude. So this is about four minutes into the compound addition, and this the second represents about um, 15 minutes into the compound addition. This is uh, post compound six. And again, you're showing uh, the, the gene dot toxin behaves very different than, than protoxin of the uh, other control group. So to have a better view of the uh, effect of gene dot toxin, I uh, recreate the, the current um, profiles before the compound addition and uh, after the compound addition. So what you sh what's shown here is in black is the control current, in red is uh, the post compound span two or four minutes after compound addition. And in the uh, purple is the uh, 50 minutes after the uh, uh, compound addition. So you're saying two things. One, one is there's a moderate increase of the uh, peak current, and then there's a, um, a significant uh, slowdown of the inactivation of the sodium channel. So to um, compare the data with the uh, with the manual patch manual patch recording, this was data supplied from the alimony lab which where uh, the, the compound or the toxins were um, purchased from. It's, uh, the, this is the time course of the gene toxin uh, action on the sodium 1.5 channels. So it virtually takes about um, seven minutes to reach the peak uh, effect of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, modulation. And uh, for us to analyze the, um, the effect of the, of the gene toxin, they pick the two um, metrics. One is the uh, peak amplitude of the current, uh, as shown here. One is the, uh, the amplitude of the persistent current, which is shown here at this, at this um, time point. So um, the control conditions about seven to eight milliseconds after the channel opens, um, the uh, persistent current goes back to almost zero, uh, but certainly not in the case uh, in the, uh, you know, where the, uh, the Gene toxin is, uh, is applied. Okay, so um, again, showing what a control group, um, how the control group, uh, group uh, um, um, the, the, the current remains stable for up to 30 minutes. This is this is uh, the uh, the um, post com uh, the pre compound scan number three, uh, where uh, this is showing the time point. And uh, after the compound addition, uh, the current remains fairly stable for up to, um, you know, 42 minutes, so 35 minutes after the, uh, the, the beginning of the, uh, the, the data acquisition. The uh, difference, uh, there's uh, about 12% of current rundown compared um, from the, uh, the, uh, the, the very beginning of the uh, experiment to towards the very end, so it's, uh, it's um, reasonably Good. Um, so what does gene toxin do then? So compared to the negative control uh, in conotoxin and the vehicle control in DMSO, gene toxin ex exhibited uh, a relatively um, bigger uh, enhancement of the peak uh, current. So this is looking at um, looking at the peak amplitude of the current, uh, whereas uh, immediately after the uh, compound addition, there's really no difference. Um, and 10 minutes um, after, afterwards, you're, show, you're seeing the peak effect of the um, enhancement of current amplitude. But if you look at the persistent component of the uh, uh, sodium current, the modulation by the gene toxin is very pronounced. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, at the time point we, we used to measure the persistent current, Typically, there's very little, less than about 2% of the total current left, um, you know, seven milliseconds after the, uh, the, the channel open. And uh, in the case of gene toxin, where you see there's a very, number two things, number one, a very pronounced enhancement of the uh, uh, persistent current. Um, and number two, there's a time dependence where the, 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 
um, enhancement of the, of the current uh, reaches the, the peak amplitude at about 10, uh, 10 minutes, um, sorry, 10 minutes uh, after the compound addition, which is very in alignment with the, um, very much in, al in alignment with the, uh, the manual patch time data um, that was shown before. So what about the, uh, the protoxin? In this case, again, we're looking at the, uh, the current stability in the, in the view control and in the, uh, in the, uh, in the conotoxin negative control. Uh, looking at the, uh, compared to this, looking at the protoxin, you see uh, immediately after the compound addition, there's a um, sizable reduction of the current, but the current didn't, um, you know, um, reach the maximum, you know, the current wasn't maximally inhibited until uh, 10 or even 20 minutes after the application of the compound. And something is really interesting is that uh, shown here is you know, remember we're looking at the uh, the, the peak amplitude of uh, the current from all 30 pulses within that uh, trim protocol. And uh, you're saying at the beginning, the very first uh, pulse, or pulse one, has the highest amplitude of current, whereas the last one typically have a, a, a lower ampli amplitude of the current. So 10 minutes after the uh, protoxin application, you're seeing a, a quite opposite uh, effect where the, uh, the protoxin is, um, you know, the, the, the P1 has the smallest current, whereas the P30 has the largest current. And this is not artifact as it has been repeated three times uh, in the uh, following measurements at different time points. So this would suggest that uh, the uh, binding of the toxin is somehow removed from the uh, from the channel during the the, the trend protocol. Uh, and uh, in looking at the, the uh, published literature, there's actually evidence um, just exactly supporting the uh, the, the hypothesis. Uh, so this is a, a article taken from um, Foucault et al. Uh, published in 2007, 2007 uh, where they analyzed the, uh, the binding of the protoxin to the sodium channels 1.2 and 1.5, and they concluded that, number one, the toxin binds to the uh, voltage sensor of the domain 2 of the sodium channel, and strong depolarization actually reverses the binding uh, by, uh, remove the, uh, by removing the, uh, the protoxin from the uh, uh, channel binding site. So a few examples shown here, they're not using exactly the same protocol we're using, but they're showing both the um, time dependence and the uh, voltage dependence of the, uh, uh, this uh, reversal of protoxin from the, uh, um, from the sodium channels. So this is very interesting to us. I mean, we, we started uh, the experiment without knowing that the uh, protoxin would behave differently than a typical uh, sodium channel blocker, and uh, um, having the ability to capture the uh, um, the um, the reversal of the uh, of the uh, channel inhibition provides insight into the mechanism of, mechanism of action, uh, which is uh, supported by the uh, by the knowing uh, by the uh, pub, uh, literature already published. So uh, just a quick summary, the uh, ion spiracular system uh, has very sophisticated electronic and the fluidic designs, which supports both sophisticated assay development and, um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the long assay window for analyzing of um, parameters like on and off rate of different compounds, uh, as well as the voltage and the state dependence of the uh, um, binding of the compounds to the channel. So that's all I have, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions toward the end of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, so we are collecting questions um, during the webinar, but we're going to wait until the end um, to actually ask the questions. And we're, we're aiming to finish in about 15 minutes after the hour, so um, if we run out of time, we'll answer questions by email as well. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Owen McManus. He's Director of Iron Channel Drug Discovery at Essen Biosciences, I should say Iron Channel Drug Discovery and Screening at Essen Biosciences. Um, he'll be talking today about um, drug discovery assays for Iron Channel pain targets. And Owen, I've unmuted you. Are you ready to uh, 
Yes, I yes I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and pass you the, the ball, and then um, I'll let you know when I can see your slides. Okay. Okay. I can see your slides, Owen. So you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, can everybody see those? Can you see them, Jim? Yeah, you have the dual uh, monitor thing going. I don't know if you want to try to fix it real quick or just go ahead and do it the way it is. I'll let you know when it looks when it's back to one screen. Okay. Or it, it, you can also continue the way it was because you can still see the slides. It's just two of them. Sorry about that. That's okay. Does it look better now at all or not? Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, find it. Um. Okay, I'm back to see you. Looks good. Okay, you're in screen mode now? Oh, brother. Yeah, it went back. Just, just put that as it is. You can see the slides is fine, though, and it's fine. All right. Okay. All right, so I'd like to talk about some um, some work we've done in S and Biosense recently. Um, I'm trying to develop improved assays for ion channels, and in particular, I'm going to talk about some work on some ion channel pain targets. And as you can see from the timeline below, Essen has a long history in, um, in discovering and, and uh, distributing the instruments uh, involved in used for cell-based pharmacology, starting from the flipper, going through the ironworks, and then more recently the Incusite Zone. Um, Essen's a uh, privately owned company started by Kirk Schroeder and Brad Nagel. Um, but in addition to the, to the engineering um, capabilities we have, there's also a number of people with extensive drug discovery experience, and I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done uh, uh, trying to develop improved assays for ion channel targets. Um, there's, we have three sites. The main site's in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and that's where the instruments are manufactured and distributed from. In addition, we do R&D and some discovery services there, both in on internal projects and in collaboration with partners. We also have a site in England located just outside of London where they do primarily uh, discovery services and R&D, and then they're the Center for European Sales. And then we have a smaller uh, site in, in Japan, outside of Tokyo, uh, that basically does sales and distribution throughout Asia. Uh, the main, um, the core business in the company is, is instrument uh, invention and, and, and development, and the instrument is currently sold is called is currently sold is called Incusite Zoom. It's essentially a microscope with the associated um, image analysis software. That's located within an incubator, so that allows you to do kinetic screens of uh, live cells over a long time in a fairly um, benign environment. So, it, in comparison to most sort of endpoint um, imaging analysis uh, experiments, you can actually follow the cells over a long time, and um, that has advantages. So, oh, may I interrupt for just a second? Um, so the the, uh, the way it's displayed is not it, is I think we need to, do need to fix it. So um, let's just take a minute here if we could. And what's happening is your title slide is big, and the actual slide that you're looking at is not in presentation mode. And I set this up before it came on, but when you switch back to me, it's... Uh... Yeah, okay. So let, let's just give it a minute and try to, try to make that, try to see if we can make it fair. Does that work any better? Um, they're both in full screen now, um, but they're already set. Uh, okay. Let 
this would probably work, so you can at least at least turn full screen on the. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix it. I had it fixed before. It's just uh, okay. We'll just we'll just be patient and we'll just get it. We'll get it right. That way, people can see it. Okay. Any better? Um, let me wait for the screen to refresh. I'm not seeing anything right now. Okay. Um, are you uh, sharing the application still? Yep. Yeah, I'm not getting anything. Okay. Um, Okay, there it is. That looks good? Uh, yes, it looks good. Hopefully when you go to full screen, it won't go to two. To two uh, yeah. What I can do... Uh, okay. uh, it keeps doing it. Okay, so Sorry. my suggestion would be to, to present... Oh, what? How's that? It's, it's the same. So, um, I think we just have to go with it. If you advance the slides, okay, then they're both advancing now. Like that? Yeah, I think that's good. So let's just do it like this. People will just have to zoom in their viewers. Because you can see the slides, they're just small. And this is good. Let's just go with this. Okay. Sorry about right. that. Sorry about that. Thank you. Any better? Yeah, it's good. It, it, it looks fine on the left, but I think we should just go um, because I'm, I'm not really understanding how to make it. This is about this is the best it's been, so I think that this this should we should go with this. All right, sounds good. So, okay, um, so th th so this instrument, um, as I said, it's involved in live cell imaging, and in addition to the instrument, we've developed a number of um, assays and reagents that um, support this. This instrument, and they're, they go under the name cell player. So there's um, starting from kind of more basic assays that measure proliferation and migration and cell toxicity. There's also a little more specialized assays that measure apoptosis, angiogenesis, neurite extension. In addition, there's some recent applications uh, for identifying stem cells and use in dilutional cloning. And um, we've developed the reporter genes and various reagents that allow these to work. Um, in the instrument. Um, in addition to the instrument work, we also have do some drug discovery efforts, and there's a number of ex-pharmaceutical uh, people in the company um, that have kind of tried to bring together best practices from these various companies and, uh, and apply them to our own internal programs and the programs we do with collaborators. Uh, the therapeutic exper experience goes over a fairly wide area. Primarily is centered in uh, CNS and neurological diseases, uh, in addition to pain and inflammation and a variety of other areas we've worked in, uh, most prominently cardiovascular safety. And most of that experience is based on work we've done um, in, in cell level uh, assay development. I'm going to talk about some ion channel drug targets that have been um, um, proposed for uh, no developing novel pain treatments. Uh, and there's a number of uh, steps in the pain transmission pathway where you could um, think that you could be successful in terms of blocking the pain transmission. Uh, a lot of effort recently is focused on uh, the primary sensory neurons, the nociceptors that carry the information from the periphery to the spinal cord. Um, there's a number of targets there that uh, 
that have various degrees of validation. I'm going to talk specifically today about NAV17 and TRIP-A1, which are involved in initiation and propagation of uh, nociceptive information to the spinal cord. So I think when you start a drug discovery project, probably the most important step is to pick a good target. And uh, hopefully that's, um, uh, that has some kind of uh, strong validation. And I've kind of ranked the levels of validation based on the kind of data behind them. So I would say it's kind of obvious that clinical validation is the best, the best type. Uh, the problem there is that there's not much point in, in pursuing that if there's already a really uh, uh, successful drug on the market. But in a lot of cases, there's um, a compound with efficacy that it has um, – it has certain flaws based on off-target effects or other, other sorts of uh, non-ideal properties. And one example is CAV 2.2, where uh, pre-out, which is a clinotoxin, uh, has been shown to block uh, severe pain, but it has limitations based on um, its method of deliverance and side effects. Uh, probably the next best level of validation is human genetic data, and I'm going to talk a little bit about NAV17, so I'll give more information on that later. Uh, next, that would be followed by sort of animal model data in, in, in uh, pharmacology and in, in cell-based and animal experiments. And I'll talk a little bit about a trick channel that um, that we've worked on. And then going down the list, there's other kinds of targets where it makes a lot of sense to work on them based on the known pharmacology and physiology, but, the, um, but there's still so much speculative based on um, the level of support. And then that's followed by sort of more industrialized or wide-scale target identification studies, which are actually quite popular over the last 10 years. These include genetic uh, genome-wide association studies, um, wide-scale siRNA screening campaigns, which have led to a number of interesting targets, but they still require extensive effort uh, to, va to validate them, both physiological and pharmacological work. So typically... You, you find a target using this method, and then you have to generate a small molecule probe that lets you confirm that that hypothesis is true. And then finally, there's a lot of work uh, that's done on the outside in, by scanning the literature and academic work, and in particular, uh, NIH Molecular Libraries Program, where I was associated for some time, where they've um, developed around 300 small molecule probes that are freely available, and um, they are good tools for target identification, I think. So um, ion channels, one of the important concepts when you work on them in terms of developing assays and thinking about how to develop drugs for them is that they change shape um, during dating, and that's kind of seen in these two um, structures of, of, of related but different ion channels in the closed and open conformations. And you can see there's substantial differences in the, um, in the, in the, in the shape of the channel. It's not hard to understand that there might be difference different drug binding sites that open up in the open, in the open versus closed states. And the reason this is important is that these conformational changes in dating can be driven by physiological or pathophysiological activity. So, for instance, in some kind of states like epilepsy where there's a lot of, um, a lot of neuronal tone and the cells tend to be depolarized and far fast, um, cells that, that have sodium channels in, say, or other types of channels but more in open or, or in activated states can be could be specifically targeted. Um, this, this kind of um, functional selectivity can actually um, has been successfully exploited um, in, for a number of targets, and probably the best example of this is cell type calcium channels, where um, there's a number of widely used L type calcium channel blockers that um, block l type calcium channels in vascular smooth muscle and act as antihypertensives, but they have very little effect at similar concentrations on the same channel in the cardi in cardiac muscle, which is involved in sugar and contractility. So um, this is kind of a, something you have to keep in mind in terms of picking what targets to work on and also in picking which assays you want to use to study those targets. And the trick then is to develop assays that can, can distinguish these stages of the channels. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so once you sort of pick a target and decide to go forward, you have to pick, well, what kind of, what kind of assays and what kind of approaches am I going to use? 
And the trade-off is typically between throughput and information content. So from the channel, for Ryan channels, the highest information content comes from manual electrophysiology, but it's, you know, it's, this is sort of uh, approximate um, estimates of the throughput, but it's basically pretty low and it's not enough to support real drug discovery programs. Um, recently, an introduction of automated electrophysiology machines allow you to go with much higher throughput and only really sort of modest reductions in the information content that the assays can spit out. Uh, most high throughput screens and a lot of drug discovery and ion channels is supported by fluorescent assays. The throughput is probably the highest of all the other types of assays, and the information content can actually be, be pretty good. Uh, that's, you know, sort of descending in the information content scale. You go to ion flux assays and binding assays, which are kind of falling to some degree out of favor recently. So I think that in past years, when people wanted to do real high throughput screening, you were basically stuck with fluorescent assays. But as the trend has moved towards smaller focus libraries, I think um, you can use automated electrophysiology instruments to address those kinds of uh, those kinds of um, libraries. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sodium channels. Um, they are involved in transmitting all electrical signals and neurons and other excitable cells. There's a number of different types, and they're expressed in different tissues. And in the past, there's been a number of sodium channels discovered, but mostly um, by non-mechanism or non-target-based approaches. And there's a list of them here, local anesthetics, anti-analgesics, anti-convulsants. And typically for these ones, um, they block most of the sodium channels equally, but they achieve their efficacy over safety window by state dependent inhibition. That means they block inactivated ch channels and depolarized cells better than closed channels in more uh, hyperpolarized cells. Uh, recently, there's been human genetic data that I'll talk a little bit about um, supporting a role for specifically NAB17 and 1.8 in gain transmission. And another thing you want to keep in mind is that um, in most drug discovery projects, you want to avoid blocking NAB15 because of the associated cardiovascular effects that occur when you block that channel. So the challenge has always been to increase the efficacy with reduced side effects. And as I said, that was done in the past by focusing on functional selectivity, but I think recently um, there's a way forward to go for subtype selectivity. So this sort of summarizes some of the uh, rationale for NAB17 as a target. It's located in the right types of cells. It's upregulated by a number of uh, mediators that are involved in triggering um, uh, allogenic, allogenic uh, situations. Uh, and then I think what's really put this on the map is there have been a number of human mutations that have been identified. And there's gain-of-function mutations that cause the channels to be more easily activated that cause um, a number of um, pathophysiological pain disorders. And then even more important, there have been lots of function mutations that lead to congenital inability to experience pain. So that's um, that's about as good a genetic support for an ion channel target as I've seen. And I think this data has been supported to some degree by uh, knockout studies in DRG cells. And this points to the, um, the idea that if you have a subtype selective blocker, you might be able to preferentially modulate pain signaling. Okay, so this is um, some cartoons of sodium channels from recent reviews. Um, the, the point being that um, that there's there's sort of at least three well or fairly well defined um, binding sites on these channels. The sort of classical local anesthetic sites is, in, is um, located in the central pore cavity, which is kind of right in the middle here. Um, it's, it's highly conserved across uh, all the sodium channel subtypes, so it's no surprise that the local anesthetics that bind there show very little or no subtype, no subtype selectivity. Um, there's a binding site for tetodotoxin and some other natural product toxins on the outside. There is some degree of subtype selectivity uh, for agents that block at the site, but it's, it's fairly moderate. And that kind of agrees with the sequence diversity that you see when you line up the different channels. And over this region. And then there's more recent identified uh, sites on these gating, gating paddles or gating domains that are located on the periphery of the channel. 
Uh, one of the first one of these that was described as Protox 2 that you heard a little bit about before. Um, it's a, a what's the eating modifier type of um, peptide toxin from a spider. And then more recently, the group at Icogen and Pfizer have identified and, and uh, described novel small molecule binding site on these dating domains. And um, these particular sites show a lot more variability across subtypes, and that might explain why some of these, both these small molecules and these peptides show much higher subtype selectivity than the other types of inhibitors. So with the studies I'm going to talk about use Ironworks electrophysiology as the platform. Uh, it allows you, you've heard before, it allows you to do both voltage and ligand gate occurrence. Um, it's actually quite good for things like hit to lead and SAR studies and for, to and for safety toxicity studies. And in addition, I think that you can do uh, sort of moderate size HTS campaigns on, on focused libraries. So it covers a fairly wide range of um, activities that you might want to do um, sodium channel drug discovery. And it also allows you to do a lot of the mechanistic studies and subtype selectivity studies that, um, that, that come in a little bit later on. So this now shows some of the um, sodium channel um, cell lines we've developed at ESSEN. Um, we have all of them, and by all I mean all except NAB 1.9, which has really been quite difficult to express. It's only been reported once recently by a group at Allergan and Vanderbilt. Um, so we don't have that, but we have um, ex cloned and expressed all these other sodium channels uh, and, and uh, have developed assays for them that run on uh, Ironworks um, Quattro and Barracuda. And you can see that you can group um, the various sodium channel subtypes based on whether they're sensitive to, to an animal or to trototoxin or the resistance to an animal or to trototoxin. So NAV15 is blocked by low micromolar TTX and NAV18 is almost completely resistant. One of the things that's come up recently as people have started to develop um, subtype selective compounds is that now you get, in addition to subtype selectivity, you get species differences. So, and that's not really all that surprising because th these are variable uh, domains and they vary across subtypes and they're going to vary across sequence, uh, species. So we've started to develop rodent specific um, sodium channel sublines and, and I, cell lines, and I'm showing you an example now from a rat NEB 1.8 cell line. And that's, that's important because most of the, um, most of the efficacy models are done in rodents. So you really want to know whether the compound works on the rodent channel before um, studying in, in vivo pharmacology in rodents. So this gives kind of a, the basic idea of how you, we, we and a number of others look at state dependent block of sodium channels. So when you depolarize a cell, the channels go from a cycle between closed and then open and inactivated states. And it turns out a lot of known drugs actually block the open and inactivated states preferentially over the closed states. Um, and this is, so a number of people have developed protocols over the years to look at these sorts of things. This shows an example of one type of protocol where there's a series of um, brief depolarizations activating sodium channels. This is uh, uh, I think it's NAV17, and you can see TTX, if you incubate, get negative potentials and then apply a train of action potentials, you get essentially similar block from the first to the last pulse. So um, the block of TTX isn't very much influenced by um, channel opening or inactivation. In contrast, amitriptyline, which is um, a drug that's active in a number of CNS pain, I mean, a number of uh, rodent pain models, uh, it has a, a number of other pharmacological effects, but one of them is to block sodium channels. And you can see in a similar experimental protocol, it blocks better uh, during a train of action potential. So this has something to do with why it can be effective um, effective in pain models with um, at doses where there's very uh, minor um, off-target effects. So that, that's the idea behind it. And then we've developed some more specific assays to look at this in a kind of um, um, more of a more systematic way. So this now shows the protocol where the cells are held at minus 90. There's a pulse train of 25 pulses. And then um, essentially we look at block of the first pulse to give a sort of estimate of block of resting channels, block of the 25th pulse to give an estimate of block of inactivated channels, 
and then run titrations um, for compounds using this protocol. And you can see TTX, which is a state independent block, and that's on the left here on the bottom. You get essentially similar block of the first and last pulses, and you can see that in the titrations down in the middle, down below, where uh, first and 25th pulses have very similar IC50s, which are a little hard actually to read here, but in the table you can see they're around 3 to 6 nanomolar. And then um, in contrast, um, um, state dependent blockers would tend to block the 25th pulse better. And the example here is tetracaine. I'm sorry, sorry it's just because of the size of the slide. Uh, showing up very well, but tetracaine blocks the first pulse much weaker than the 25th pulse, and that's shown in this titration in the middle here, and there's around a tenfold shift uh, for block of the first versus the 25th pulse. So this shows about a tenfold shift. It's consistent with state-dependent block by this local anesthetic. You can then use this kind of um, paradigm now to study um, all of the sodium channels. So in this case, um, this shows simply to block of the last pulse over the 25th pulse, and TTX shows what is fairly modest, but some some subtype selectivity where you look at NAV 1.8, it's not blocked at all at micromolar concentrations. NAV 1.5 is expected blocked in the low micromolar concentration. The other compounds are all blocked in the nanomolar uh, concentration range. What was kind of surprising to us was that there's actually a fairly large spread across this, and we were a little um, surprised at this, but it repeats quite well. And I think it's probably the first um, study I've seen where they've looked at all the subtypes using a similar uh, protocol, and we can see there's probably about an eight-fold shift in sensitivity to TTX, where I think it's most sensitive for um, 1.6 and then somewhat less sensitive for 1.7. Uh, in contrast, um, tetracaine, which is, a, again, a local anesthetic that blocks essentially all the subtypes equally at the 25th pulse. So when you have this kind of um, paradigm and, and these tools set up, you can actually go across all the subtypes and characterize compounds for whether they block um, with, with, with functional selectivity or with subtype selectivity, or both. So this now shows um, a, not a slightly different protocol where um, we actually hold negative and then apply a very long pulse to inactivate most of the channels and then test with the second pulse. And this kind of shows one of the advantages of electrophysiology where you can set up protocols that mimic different types of physiological activity. So the idea behind this is that neurons that are depolarized and, you know, and sort of injured neurons, um, uh, they'll be somewhat depolarized and that this activity won't perfectly mimic that, but it gives you some kind of sense of what you would expect if you apply a compound to those types of cells. Uh, in this case, you can see tetracaine. There's about a, what is this, around a, a tenfold shift between block of resting, which is in the gray here, or in activated channels. And then if we do the same thing across all the subtypes, you see it's basically, again, with the frequency-dependent protocol, there's almost no subtype selectivity. Um, so this is an example of a compound that shows um, state dependence but no subtype selectivity, which is essentially in agreement with the classical local anesthetic profile. Then um, this is another type of compound that's in contrast. This is compounds we, um, on a project we do in collaboration with AMRI. This is a um, sodium channel blocker that should, for NAB17. If you look on the left panel in the gray, essentially inactive on resting channels and pretty potent block on inactivated state channels using this long depolarizing pre-pulse. And you can see that the potency goes from 60 nanomolar to 15 nanomolar as you incubate for a longer time. So it's not surprising it's a potent compound. It takes a while to get to steady state. Um, and then if you look across subtypes, the kind of more shocking thing is that it blocks NAB17 quite potently. This is the inactivated state block with much weaker block of the, um, of the other subtypes. So this is now an example of a compound that's both state dependent and cytotoxic selective. Um, now, given that kind of um, those tools, you can go across um, all of these channels for, for a number of compound types, and this shows examples of uh, three compounds we've done in collaboration with AMRI. These are based on templates we found in the public domain, and you can see you go from TM1, which has 
um, both subtype and state dependence to TM3, which has sort of mild subtype selectivity but good state dependence, and then um, this other one, TM2, which blocks, and interestingly, any of you six and one seven but doesn't block the others. And then by reference, tetracaine shows um, no subtype selectivity. So just to summarize these compounds, there's varying degrees of subtype selectivity in vivo activity. These things is not well known at all, um, at least from our point of view. Uh, they have limited physical chemical properties, but the important point is they demonstrate a path forward um, to developing um, subtypes like the small molecule blockers. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to a few slides on AAA1. That's another um, target that a lot of people are interested in for pain. Uh, the validation is somewhat less, but it's still pretty good. Uh, it's a 6TM, domain, 6TM um, protein. Uh, four of these make an ion channel. It's skated by a number of stimuli, mostly reactive uh, residues that, uh, that, that affect the cysteine residues, things like mustard oil, cinnamaldehyde. Uh, in addition, there's sort of non-reactive things, including thymol that activate it. There's a number of other gating mechanisms that modulate that aren't fully understood, and it's also a weakly voltage-gated ion channel, as are most other trip channels. Um, it's involved in pain, as I said. There's other people that have presented data showing that it's involved in cough. And then more recently, there's been two papers um, showing its role in uh, two different types of itch, where it's sort of a final mediator for um, peripheral stimuli to start the itch pathway, uh, start start the itch um, transmission in the uh, peripheral, nose, peripheral uh, sensory neurons. So um, this just shows some manual electrophysiology from our colleagues in England, and it shows um, cell held at minus potentials. Um, I think it was minus 90. Addition of a tear gas derivative, which is another known trip A1 activator, you get a large inward current. Uh, that can be blocked by a trip A1 blocker and then completely blocked by another uh, reference compound from the literature, A96707.9. And then this can be washed out. So this shows that you can do these kinds of experiments in electrophysiology, and there's a lot of flexibility in how you do it, and the quantitation is quite good. The problem is that repeat applications are kind of difficult due to the nature of some of the stimuli and some other things that aren't completely understood. So it's very hard to do this in the kind of standard um, agonist pro 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 protocol where you would apply an agonist and then apply an antagonist and look for a difference. Um, so it, it, it's kind of um, made that kind of experimental approach um, pretty difficult, and we've, we've gone ahead and developed um, an ion loop paracoot assay for this um, that kind of gets around that. This just shows the solutions we use. These experiments are done in TPC mode, meaning there's um, the recording for a number of cells in each well at the same time. And this just shows an example of a recording uh, in response to an agonist trigger right here. So this now shows some of the agonist um, uh, currents we see uh, in response to uh, some of the inward currents we see in response to different kinds of agonists. These include, in the left here, AITC, thyramol, 3TC. And you can see that there's kind of different kinetic profiles depending on the agonist. And then if you look at the dose response curve for AITC, you can see it's, you see a, both a, a, a change in the peak height and the uh, rate of onset. And then we've then titrated these um, these compounds shown here, and the, the, you, you, we get numbers that agree reasonably well with literature values. Where thymol gets an EC50 of around 50 nanomolar, and the other two give EC50s of around 200 micromolar. Sorry, 50 micromolar, and the others are around 200 micromolar. So this shows you can use this use this um, setup to to study antagonist block and. Uh, the way this is done is done in tight mode where you compare um, everybody gets triggered by the agonist, which in this case is AITC, and then you compare uh, wells with, uh, with different, different antagonists uh, applied during the pre-incubation period. And you can see uh, pre-incubation with increasing concentrations of, um, this is again the A96079 compound, compound the, uh, um, the current gets delayed and gets smaller. If you plot the, uh, the block of that thing, we got an IC50 in the, uh, in the um, 
around 100 nanomolar, 100 micromolar, 100 nanomolar range. Sorry. So this now importantly shows the sort of a play view of the assay. So to run an assay in this mode, all the in this mode, all the control laws have to be pretty consistent. We can see that uh, um, we get a pretty consistent response to AITC. And then looking at titrations going from uh, right to left across the plate, we get nice consistent responses. These grayed out wells or, or failures that um, do meet the criteria for resistance and other sorts of criteria. And you can use this then to go forward and actually titrate compounds um, in uh, this plate-based mode. So then to summarize what I've said so far, I think that there's a number of opportunities in ion channel drug discovery and in pain particularly that have resulted from better genetic studies and better ways to validate targets and also better ion, better assay technologies to study these. Um, the Barracuda, which I've shown you some data from, enables medium to high throughput screening. It gives good flexibility. It gives high information content and enough uh, throughput to, to basically um, support most types of drug discovery projects. And then in terms of sodium channels, the past efforts have been directed at finding compounds that didn't really have subtype selectivity but showed a therapeutic index by blocking um, inactivated, preferentially blocking inactivated state channels. Uh, I think recent studies that have come out of the Pfizer Icogen group have pointed the way towards finding um, subtype selectivities, subtype selective compounds, but the main challenge there is to is to um, engineer and drug-like properties while in these compounds while maintaining selectivity. And this just shows the people that were involved in these studies, primarily John Rausch, Kevin Allard, and Livio Pekka, and Dave Rock in Ann Arbor, and Tim Dale, uh, Srinivasan, and Del Chazis in um, UK. So I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Owen. Um, we're actually going to hold off on the questions until the end of the, of the presentation. Um, uh, we are collecting questions, and we'll, if we don't get to them at the end, we will answer them by email. So uh, I think from, from Shin's talk and from Owen's talk, it's pretty clear that Barracuda uh, works well to study state use dependent um, blockers of ion channels. It can deliver quite complicated protocols and also performs well with wide assay windows. Um, at this point, we're going to switch gears a little bit over to a platform that we recently began offering, which is the Ionflux. And for that, I'm going to go ahead and give you a short um, introduction to it. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and give myself control of the presentation here. Um, and I have a few little technical things I need to do, and then I can get started. Um, Okay, so my, my portion here should be about five minutes, so uh, we're aiming to end between uh, 15 minutes after the hour and actually probably more like 30 minutes after the hour. Um, so my, my presentation will be very short. I just wanted to give you an introduction to the ion flux because it is quite different from anything else we've ever offered and I, I think from most other automated electrophysiology equipment. Um, it took me a few looks, more like three or four looks at it before I really understood how it works, but it's actually very interesting and works quite well. Um, I just show here first a, a, a slide of uh, GAB experiments that's done, and we're going to use that throughout the presentation to just show mechanically how the instrument functions. Um, so basically, again, very very briefly, there's two consumables available for this instrument, either uh, ensemble recordings or what we like to call population recordings or gigafield uh, uh, substrates. Um, Running the instrument is quite cheap, and uh, buying the, the instrument in terms of CapEx is, is fairly cheap for about the cost of a manual patch plant setup for the uh, 16 channel system. Um, we like to say it's as easy to use as a plate reader, and it's a small tabletop unit like a plate reader. Very few moving parts, um, so it's quite reliable. Um, here's a picture of it up close. And then getting into the nitty gritty of how it actually works. Um, it's all in the, in the plate design. So there's two different plates that, that can be used. I should say there's a different plates for each of the instruments. The 96 wall footprint is for the IronFlux 16 instrument. The 34 wall footprint is for the IronFlux HT instrument. But they both have this um, polymer bottom with a microfluidic network. What you're seeing here is the 34 wall plate. And what, it, what it has is 32 experimental plans. And I, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. 
um, today. So with that, that's what the next series of slides is for. Um, each of these experimental plans is essentially a way to um, to perform two recordings. So think of the T1 and the T2, which stands for trap one and trap two, as the two electrodes. So you're you're performing um, experiments in duplicate here in each experimental plan. Um, the inflow and the outflow are simply the, the perfusion that gets the cells in there. Um, and then the C1 through C8 are where the compounds go, compounds 1 through 8. So it's, it's again, very different from anything that we're used to seeing in the planar patch, patch world. Um, it made the cover of um, assay and drug devel development technologies in the uh, last summer, or summer of 2012, I should say. Um, and I show this because it really gives a blow out of the of exactly how it how it works. From the experimental plan, if you blow up the just where the where the traps are, you can see that the cells are trapped on these two uh, red rectangular areas here, and there's a blow up of the actual of a photomicrograph of the cells being trapped. And you'll see a movie of that in just a moment. Um, I mentioned that we have that the instrument is available with either uh, ensemble recordings of 20 cells or a single cell recording, and uh, both instruments, the 16 and the HT, have availability of the ensemble plates and the single cell plates. And so those familiar with population recording know that the ensemble recordings are nice because essentially your, your non-expression cells are averaged out as a recording, um, whereas in, in some cases uh, users may want to use a single cell or it's actually two in parallel here, um, and you can obtain giga seals. We have data for that. I'm not going to show that today. Um, here's a movie I was telling you about. So this is the trapping of the cells, and this is an ensemble recording. So essentially the cells are being trapped onto the 20, um, uh, what are analogous to electrodes at each trap. You're looking on the left at trap one with 20 electrodes, and on the right the, the part, a portion of trap two. And you can see that the cells are being pulsed back and forth and being drawn into the into where the uh, the holes are that are analogous to the electrodes. Okay, then just functionally, um, I mentioned that there's there's a uh, compound can be added in C1 through C8, and that's shown in the colored uh, the colored wells here. Um, and basically, the other two are for the, the trapping of the elect of the cells and the inflow and the outflow. So I'll show a quick movie of that here. And this shows from the from the plate view down into a map view of the of the experimental plan and the compounds coming in um, on the left here and then the cells coming in and being trapped at those two traps that you just saw the movie of. And this is just showing the cells coming in. Um, another quick clip that I'll show is uh, actual well a cartoon of an experiment being performed and how the uh, how the uh, compounds are actually added. So I'll, I'll show that briefly. Um, let me just go right to the movie. Um, essentially, this is a continuation of the last clip. Um, the cells have been tracked, and the compounds come in one by one through the eight different channels. And you can see the, the, the cartoon of the GABA experiment um, growing there in, in the inset. Okay, so in terms of the channels that have been recorded from, here's a list of channels. There's quite a few more than this, but this is um, a list of a few months old. Um, so it works on most voltage and ligand gated channels, and it works quite well on, on ligand gated channels, um, and especially uh, fast channels. So acetylcholine receptors have been measured on here. Um, I, I'm not going into detail here, but this this will be recorded, and we, if you want more information feel free to, co uh, to contact our field application scientists or myself. Um, there's also been some nice work done on NMDA receptors, and there's a bit of a trick here where we, um, where we flow two solutions at once and then turn off the bottom one in order to get a, a rapid, um, to get NMDA to the channel rapidly. Um, and that's also, more detail can be given by our app scientists on that one. Um, and then also there's been a paper pu uh, published by um, on herd biophysics by a group over in the UK. Um, so it does work quite well with high, with voltage gated ion channels as well as, as ligand gated ion channels. So in conclusion to my summary, I just wanted to show our, the different tools we have for drug discovery. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this all the way from Flipper 
um, all the way down to uh, basically our, our patch plant rigs. Um, so we like to, to think that we, we offer solutions at every level of the drug discovery funnel. Um, with that, I'll go ahead to our next speaker, and that would be um, Kenneth Um from the University of California at Davis. And let me do a little housekeeping here, and um, I'll unmute Kenneth and ask him if he's ready here. So Kenneth, are you ready to go ahead and receive the, uh, the product to go ahead and present? Yep. Okay, I'll go ahead and pass it to you. Again, we're holding questions until the end, and since we are running a little bit behind, um, we probably will not answer questions live, so we'll probably answer them all by email. Um, okay, that, thank Kenneth, you. I'll hand it over to you, and I'll let you know when when um, when I can see your slides. Okay. And I'm just handing them to you right now. Okay, all right. Okay, I can see your slides. All right, sounds good. Let me get to the presentation mode. Okay, looks good. All right, so um, thanks again for the intro. And um, pretty much I'll just be talking about a validation of different derivatives of a gastropod toxin, 6 bromo 2 metaprotrypamine, or I'll just call this BRM2 for short. Uh, what, I'm, what I'll show you to this morning is uh, I'll be showing you data on uh, the efficacy of, this, of these different derivatives using the ion flux system. And I, all this data was uh, obtained from using a ensemble setup from the ion flux system with the 384 row plate. So before I get into the data, I'll give you a little uh, quick background of what this what this toxin does. And um, back in 2004, uh, they tested this compound on shaker channel, and they found that it slows activation and and uh, decreases the overall current. And at and this is pretty, this pretty, this works pretty well in macromolar concentrations. And they also showed that, uh, it decreased the gating, where, uh, you see a drop from the small line to the thick line, which is also 5 macromolar of DRMT. So, um, they found out that this, this, uh, compound does not block the pore, but it binds to the voltage sensors of the ion channels that the previous speakers were talking about, and it uh, it inhibits the activation of the channel. And with with their uh, intense analysis of of this of this compound, they came up with this simple model. Uh, they have a more complicated model, but this is their simple model that they came up came up with, where we have the voltage sensor in the resting state here, and it goes to the activated state, then it opens. And the idea with the BRMT compound is that it inhibits this portion of transition from the resting to the activated state of the voltage sensors. So with that quick intro on how BRMT works, uh, we came up with the question, well, BRMT works, but it's slightly unstable. And what happens in the presence of a little bit of light is it actually uh, the dimer breaks up into monomers, and uh, the monomers of this the monomer version of BRMT actually does not uh, inhibit the channels that well. So the question is, can we make stable derivatives of BRMT, and are they biologically active? So um, we made five different compounds of these BRMT derivatives that I'll show you today. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to show you our general experimental outline. Uh, so I tested these channels on KV 1.4, and the way I, the way I express KV 1.4 in, in the Chinese cancer ovary cells was by inducing it with 12 hours of tetracycline, 
and and then putting it into the ion flux system to uh, see if see if uh, the BRMT derivatives are potent or they're still biologically active. So here's a little cartoon of the tro cell with 12-hour tetracycline, and then you get the KD1.4 expression on the cells. So now we have channel, and if we apply the the toxin through through the different wells in the 384 well plate, um, we can get a nice dose response uh, output from the ion flux machine. So the first first compound that we tested just to validate if we could see good current was the wild type, the 6 BRMT compound. And um, I just color coded this in a rainbow color format. So in red, you see vehicle. Yellow, you see 1.5 micromolar of 6 BRMT, 3 micromolars of BRMT, 620, or point, sorry, 6.25 micromolar of BRMT, 12.5 micromolar, 25 micromolar, and then at the end, I did a hammer dose of 4 AP just to kill out all the current, just in case there's some residual current that I was, I'm unable to step the end. And it turns out that uh, 6BRMT is is a lot more potent than what I was seeing in shaper channels. Um, so for KB 1.4, we see uh, a parent IC50 of 0.43 micromolar, which is pretty potent. So going from there, uh, we started testing the other other compounds, and I'll just be calling them derivative one through five. So the first derivative that you see here um, is is um, a closely related, very closely related, actually, to the wild type LMT. And this was, we made this compound similar so that we can see if we can make a slightly different compound and if it'll still be active. And um, if you, as you see here, it looks, the raw current choices look very similar to the wild type. And when we look at the analysis of all the, all the wells, then you see that the IC50 here is uh, 0.3 micromolar, which is very similar to the wild type DRMT. And um, the next next derivative we tried, uh, it, you can see here, it didn't inhibit it as well, but it still did a pretty good job of inhibiting the current. So again, it's the same layout. It's the red is vehicle, yellow is one micromolar, and uh, so on and so forth. It's actually the 625. Sorry, it's actually 6.25 micromolar. And you see that it's it inhibits the current pretty well. And I was able to come up with a another good IC50, and this one came out using the a linear isotherm um, Hill Hill equation. It came up with the IC50 of 1.38 micromolar. And going on with uh, BRMT derivative number three, uh, this inhibited it pretty well as well. And we see the inhibition here with the apparent IC50 of 1.3 micromolar. And derivative four, is you see the same trend where it's pretty potent again here. And with the apparent IC50 of about one micromolar, 0.96 micromolar. And the last derivative we tried out, it also inhibits. So, so far we're on a good track here where all these different derivatives are working. And this one gave us an IC50 of 1.39 micromolar. So if you if you look at all this, um, the parent IC50s of all these different compounds, uh, we realize that these derivatives 
the chain of the inhibitory activity against KV1.4. And um, these are uh, supposed to be more stable than the 6BRMT, so it'll be um, a better better tool to actually um, look at the inhibition of KV1.4 and um, better understand its properties. And the, the reason we chose KV1.4 is uh, it's it's uh, highly expressed in the heart and in the in the dentate gyrus. And the downside of even though we know it's localized there, the downside is we don't really know what it does. And in the heart, people think it's part of the um, the transient outward current, but there's the transient outward current that's fast and slow. But they believe that 1.4 is mainly for the slow component of the fast outward current and then the transient outward current. So, um, so this just brings in another tool that you can use to try to figure out and tease out um, the different subtypes of these uh, voltage-gated potassium channels. And that that was it. it Try to keep it. I try to keep it nice and sweet. Um, I'd like to thank my PI John Sack for um, pretty much allowing me to do these ex experiments. Chris Dockendorf who made these different um, made these different toxins, uh, and Justin Litchfield who did the preliminary studies on it, and the people at Flexion, namely Ali who helped me uh, troubleshoot the machine, and um, Molecular, from Molecular Devices, James Constantine, who uh, set up this whole webinar series. And okay, that, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. I have to say, you're one lucky guy to have been able to have a, an automated e instrument as part of your PhD thesis. So that's the first I've ever heard of that. Um, <laughs> so um, we do have a whole bunch of questions, um, actually too many to sort through. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave the line open here. Um, and uh, allow you to, to ask questions for another 10 minutes or so. Um, and I'll leave the, my presentation up um, uh, during that time. And then feel free to ask questions. We're going to have to answer them all by, um, by email. Um, I want to thank the, hold on, I'm sorry. Um, I need to share my application. So I'd like to thank the presenters today, so um, Shin, uh, my colleagues for the last four years or so, applicants and here at Black Devices, Owen McMahon, somebody who I've also known for a long, very long time, um, uh, and Kenneth Ohm, who I've just recently met. Uh, we thank you all for your, for your very nice talks. Um, just another reminder of all the wonderful stuff we sell here at Black Devices in terms of electrophysiology. Um, these these webinars are recorded, so we urge you to uh, have a look at them or download them. Um, I think I'm also going to try to get the PDFs of the talks up there as well. Um, uh, so you can go to our, web, our Barracuda webpage to see these. And then what, what we'll do now is we'll go ahead and go silent, but we'll leave the line open um, for about 10 minutes so you can ask questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending.